Hello and welcome to Ride Buddies. It's crazy to think about, but here we are already on our fifth episode. And this time we've got a couple household names in the world of long distance cycling. World Tour Pro and Alt Cycling Hero, Lachlan Morton, and Ultra Endurance Legend, Kurt Refsnyder. While they've apparently been corresponding for years, this was as close to an in real life meeting as the two have ever had. In 2007, Kurt swapped cyclocross racing for ultra endurance cycling and is considered to be a true veteran of the sport. He has won and or set records on the Tour Divide, the Arizona Trail 300 and 750, the Colorado Trail Race, and too many others to count. For real, it's a long list. He's also a professor with a PhD in earth science as well as a coach, but nowadays focuses on his role as co-founder of a nonprofit known as Bikepacking Roots, while continuing to compete and chase the occasional FKT. Meanwhile, Lachlan, AKA Locky, has been juggling professional road racing with adventure cycling for the last four years, finding plenty of success at events like the GB Duro and the Leadville Trail 100, just to name a few. Earlier this year, he became the talk of the Tour de France when he rode every kilometer of the tour, including distances between each stage, start and finish, solo and self-supported. Just crazy, awesome, inspiring stuff. And in this episode, the two talk about falling head over heels in love with off-road cycling, some of their best and worst experiences on the bike, wild sleep-deprived hallucinations, and a whole lot more. So saddle up and tune in. You're in for a great ride with these two. <laughs> Lachlan, it's great to finally sort of have an in-person conversation with right. you. I feel like we've been messaging back and forth about various things for like three years now probably yeah i think it's mainly just me asking for advice but uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to work well, out what i'm gonna go do and um, i think we actually probably almost met in person i think like 10 years ago when i remember i was living in boulder at the time and mm -hmm. i was still a road racer at that point and i just moved from the midwest and in the midwest i was like you know, could occasionally win a race. And then I moved to Boulder and suddenly racing against like all the pros that live there. Yeah. And suddenly I was like, just trying to stay at, like not get dropped in <laughs> the first like miles of any race. But I remember hearing that you and your brother were coming over and I think you were juniors at the time still. Yeah. And you, we all went to, what, what was, there's that, not Sunshine Canyon, but the steep road that climbs up the other side from boulder canyon uh yeah uh magnolia yeah some yeah. Hill, the hill climb that went up that and that's right and you finished up in eldora yeah and yeah. Yeah, yeah i think we were both in that and you were like danced off the front as i danced off the back right when it got <laughs> steep <laughs> that was that but <laughs> yeah. i think i think my brother won that race really, um, really? yeah 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 I think uh, from memory, that was like my first ever Pro 1 2 race. Um, and I got smoked also. <laughs> I feel like that was like, that was like the height of like the Boulder road scene, I think. Huh. You know, like there was just so many good guys and like so much racing going on at that point that like, um, yeah, that was like also my introduction to Boulder racing. And huh. I think like, at that time, I was so hungry for competition that I just loved it. <laughs> but, um, it's that funny was... now, like, more and more here, you just see, well, it seems like all the roads that, like, I started to find, and, like, two or three years ago, it feels like I was the only one on them. It's, like, now it's just full of bike riders. Huh. Most, on, mostly on roads and, like, like the, the cheap roads and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool. Like, it's, it's cool to see that, like, shift. Um, it's definitely like less competitive and less people out there like going for KOMs and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, which is not, I mean, there's still plenty of fast people around, but the bike scene here seems to have changed a fair bit. Oh, that's, that's awesome to hear because it guys definitely started to drag. I lived there for six years while I was in grad school and started to drag on me in the last few years I was there that just like everybody rode farther than you were went faster than you, you know, they had something that they did better than you on any particular ride and, and made sure they talked about that. And so true. It's like, I can't like Flagstaff is the big climb from town here that everyone does, you know, like on road bikes. Mm -hmm. 
And I just can't write that anymore. Like, <laughs> it just, like, takes you back to a point in my life when, like, I could remember, like, what time I needed to be at each switch back to, like, be going fast. And, like, mm-hmm. there's just too much, too much attached to that, like, old, my old self that I just don't go up there anymore. <laughs> oh, it's really interesting to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, like, I think it's so fascinating that you as a pro, I mean, you've been a pro roadie for a decade at this point, yeah. more yeah. or less. And like, I don't, I've, I've sort of cursorily followed pro road racing for longer than that, because I, I started getting into the road scene at a very different level from you, but like 15 years ago, probably um, yeah. in the Midwest. And it's like all these, you see all these personalities kind of come and go in the, the scene. And the only ones that have really fascinated me over the years were folks that were doing something a little different from the norm, which I'm sure you hear all the time, but like your, your curiosity for big and ultras and for off-road stuff and for bike packing has just been so cool to see. And I really have a lot of admiration for folks that are, you know, this is their job, but they're willing to like try to right. find, find a niche outside that to continue to really be excited about what they're doing and, and find newness. So I'm excited to hear a little bit more from, from your perspective about like what what is it that's drawn you to those sorts of things um i think like it's just kind of like for me it came out of like a i was kind of very burnt out on road racing um but knew like like when i was a kid i was just like to rub my bike right and there was like some like point there when it became my job and like i was like a very hyper competitive like you know teenager and just kind of lost that um love for just like the simple you know riding um so yeah i think like the first like i did like a small bike packing trip with my brother and then like um sorry my dog's going crazy (laughs) (laughs) um yeah and then like i don't know i just started like filling up a backpack and kind of doing like point to point rides um more so out of just trying to escape like it was generally when i was in europe just trying to get out of like the town of girona where i lived in where like um you know pro cycling was everything and i'd just kind of like find these little escapes and i got like a little trailer and started like just riding out to the mountains for a few days just more like to get away yeah um and then i was kind of like i I feel like this is uh i mean it, it totally like rekindled my love for the sport um and then that kind of like i guess started my curiosity for like just different like scenes in bike riding because there's so many of them right Mm -hmm. um and i kind of realized that i'd only discovered this like slither of it and there was so much more to see um and then i feel like once you start going uh off-road um on bikes it's pretty hard to go back on the road <laughs> um like it's, there's yeah, just it's, so much you know i I'm, i've always loved to like basically ride everything wherever i am um mm-hmm. and try and like i'm constantly trying to put together you know like my ideal loop for like everywhere i am um, yeah so like find find like, all the connections that you could talk, yeah, potentially exactly. use yeah totally so that like you know, every now and then you can show someone this amazing loop that, like, you know, they never knew were there. Um, but increasingly that involves just, like, riding on trails and, and Jeep roads and more walking, and, you know, just, <laughs> like... Um, and to the point now where, like, I can't... I mean, I don't have a road bike here in the country. Um, I don't really, like... I love to race on the road because it's, it's intense and it's, like, a very different... Um, very different thing than I normally do but like I don't really just go and ride road bikes anymore um so like yeah it was it was kind of like a gradual thing that happened and I still like I'm still a fan of road racing I love to watch it um and as I said I love to jump in there every now and then but all my interests have kind of like I guess they grew from that but they've grown away from that um and like yeah it's just kind of for me, like, um, I'm never, like, I'm not really, um, like, goal-driven. I'm just kind of, like, I, every day I'm trying to get out there and just, like, have the nicest ride I can. 
So I kind of wake up and work out what ride I'm going to do, what the weather is, you know, kind of like what I'm feeling and then uh, work out what bike I'm going to ride and then just go from there. And then that kind of just like, I think whatever I'm like into at that point draws me to different events. Um, so like, you know, sometimes that's ultra stuff. Um, sometimes it's mountain biking. Sometimes it's road racing. It's just kind of what I'm like sort of feeling at the time. Um, and yeah. I'm kind of luck- lucky that I kind of have a, a bit of freedom to like chase certain things um, that interest me. And I just try and stay like pretty genuine to those interests, you know, um, which keeps me like super motivated. <laughs> you know, I love <laughs> to get out and like just ride because it's sort of um, there's no one, no one making me do it, you know. So that's kind of my a quick history of my like experience in riding how about, how about you you've been so you, I, I didn't know you raced road bikes yeah so i i mean i think like you i i grew up just riding bikes and loving bikes for the freedom that they provided to just like get out of my neighborhood and explore and i mean as a like middle i mean even before middle school i remember just like having this cool little bike and being like oh you can get like little bike bags that go on different places to carry more stuff and so i had this dorky little bike you know, in like fifth, sixth grade, set up like that, and then got a actual. Well, no, it was in um, when I was like thirteen. I remember being in a li- public library, and it was back when they have all the magazines like spread out on th- the shelves. You can see the like cover of each um, magazine of the current issues. And I remember looking at the bike one because I was just interested in bikes at the time. And there was a bicycling one with all their kind of kitschy, eye-catching titles. And one of them was like, "You too can ride a century." I was like, how do you ride a hundred years? And so I like <laughs> open it up and look at it like, oh, it's a hundred miles. That's a good ride. <laughs> and they had these little training plans in there for how many, like how many miles or how many hours to ride for, you know, three months leading up to your, your century. And if you want to like survive it or thrive or, you know, go fast. Yeah. So I remember taking that home and then going back to the library again later to return it. And I photocopied the little training chart in there and was like, I should do this. And so my dad, took me out to some thrift stores and we found a hundred dollar road bike and some old Panasonic team. And he helped me rebuild everything on it. And then I followed the little training plan for like three months. And he drove me out to somewhere West of Minneapolis in the, the farm fields. And he had found a like 20 mile loop that he thought was safe for me to ride. And he just yeah. like, sat in this church parking lot for seven hours while I rode five That's laps good. around. And that was kind of the beginning of my infatuation with like longer bike rides and, that's and cool. So I got into mountain biking for a while after that. And then I was a Nordic ski racer for a while. And then when I was living in Wisconsin, um, the Nordic ski scene is just kind of literally melting away because there's not enough snowfall there anymore for it. Mm-hmm. And so I just I started road riding a lot more and got on a um, kind of regional elite team out of there and spent probably five years pretty focused, mostly on cyclocross actually, but doing road for a fair bit of the time and moved to Boulder in that. And then after a few years of being like super focused on cyclocross, um, which was a really fun scene to be part of in Boulder. There's just so many yeah. strong riders and the whole front range scene is great. Um, but I got tired of like literally racing in small circles mm-hmm. every year, same courses and everything. And then heard about this race called the Grand Loop out in Western Colorado and Eastern Utah, which doesn't exist anymore. But it was one of the, it was basically the first bike packing ultra in the lower 48 that wasn't like dirt roads and yes. it was all gnarly mine roads and coca Pelli was part of it um yeah. and so i decided to like well hmm, could i do that it was kind of like that same century mentality from when i was 13 it's like 360 miles in one push like can i do that i had no clue and i had kind of no business jumping into something like that but i did and survived it i remember feeling like that on the first uh our first ultra was the gb duo in the uk it's like the Mm -hmm. length of the uk um and i remember being so excited because it was like there was no more curfew you know it's like i always felt like i had to be home like kind of (laughs) when it's getting dark otherwise people get worried and i'm like it's gone (laughs) you know like this is super exciting i can just keep going (laughs) um yeah i don't know there's i feel like there's something um like the experience you get through like a an ultra is so like profound in a lot of ways it just draws you back even though at the time it can be like so 
overwhelming and like so incredibly difficult. I just feel like I had the same thing. Like I was like, I don't think I need to do one of these again. <laughs> and then like a week later, I was like, eh, I might go do the Colorado Trail. Like that's, I'm, I'm going to be around there. Uh, like, <laughs> but that's that crack but that. the GB Duro uh, is all pavement, right? Or mostly pavement? Uh, no, it's like quite a lot of off road. Um, I think it's maybe like 50 50. Okay. Um, and there's some pretty like, there's a lot of bits that you'd rather be on a mountain bike. Um, you do like quite a lot of walking. Oh, okay. Like those like UK hiking paths, you know? Yeah, bridleways um, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Lots of bridleways. Um, but I actually kind of enjoyed all that element because that was all very new to me like the idea of walking your bike <laughs> it's like the first time i was doing it i was just like this this sucks like <laughs> this really sucks and after a while you're just kind of like that's oh, nice it breaks it up a bit you know like, i'll be excited <laughs> when i get back on my bike and, um so yeah like the but the colorado trail again the, i mean that's just like it was another level of um you know difficulty yeah I and i think that was that was when you first reached out to me it was before yeah that because i think yeah you had been you'd been planning on doing it during the for the actual race which yeah was, exactly I think the last year that i raced it and then you yeah. end up what you had I to go race the tour of utah or something like that yeah exactly <laughs> i did utah and leadville and then like snuck off to do the um colorado trail but i had no idea what i was getting in for in that like because i was like hey i've ridden mountain bikes a bit like i'll be all right <laughs> And then how could it be? And then after like maybe twelve hours on the trail, I was just like, "Oh my god, I'm so far, <laughs> I'm so far over my head." Yeah. <laughs> but you still you smoked it, like didn't? I... Uh, I mean, I did. Like in in my head, like it just totally kicked my ass. You know, yeah. I felt like I was limping along that thing. Um, but it was great because it was like a super humbling experience, you know, um, because like I think in GB Juro, um, I got not I got lucky, um, but I just like I mean, yeah, I had a very smooth run in a lot of ways. Um, and so I was like kind of like, oh, yeah, I could just do these things like this is like fun. Um, and then. Yeah, maybe 24 hours into Colorado Trail, I was like, "Oh my god, I have no idea what I'm doing." <laughs> what was the what was the like most in your face element of that that made you feel like um, not feel confident about yourself or your your preparation? I think, like, the first night, um, I was like at, near the high point there, and I just hadn't done any like real research on the route mm -hmm. and i was like up on that high plateau there where you just oh, kind of like sitting 13,000 feet <laughs> exactly and i was trying to like find somewhere to sleep and i was like i can't sleep this high like one because i only brought an emergency bivy and like a pretty light sleeping bag so i was like it's just too cold mm -hmm. um and two like you can't like when you try and sleep that high you're not going to sleep are you? you just kind of like lie there and listen to your heartbeat really fast <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so, um i was like i have no idea like how like i was like i could be up this high for like another 50 miles i don't know um and i was like i just don't have enough stuff and even the lights i brought were just useless you know like i could hmm. barely see where i was going um and I was just like, I've really, um, yeah, I'm like way over my head. And I kind of made a conscious decision at that point to be like, all right, I can't push this now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have like, I don't have the experience to like race this thing. Um, and so I basically was like, I need to limp through the next day and then have like a full sleep. Mm -hmm. And then. At that point, I was like, when I wake up, I'll decide if I keep going. And then I woke up and I was like, I, I kind of want to see the whole thing now. Mm -hmm. um, and then I still, yeah, I finished it. But um, like, I, th I, my, I think about it probably at least two or three times a week. Hmm. Just about like, 
that's the only route I've done where I keep thinking about it. It's like kind of like when you're trying to link something, you know, in your backyard. Yeah. Like if I could just, like I think about <laughs> like that and I'm just like, God, that kicked my ass so bad. I have to go back and do it. Like not to go like necessarily go fast or whatever, just to do it and have it be like, an enjoyable experience and be able to push like comfortably you know but, i mean that's the beauty of these things is you have to start somewhere and like you're never so, you're never going to know exactly what you're getting into in an event like that without trying it and yeah you know, yeah yeah you can, you can there's a threshold to how prepared you can be as a rookie yeah. in, in anything like that so at some point you just have to dive right in and, and see exactly um and like i still kind of have that approach of like i never want to be like over prepared to the point where like nothing can happen mm -hmm. you know if that makes sense and that also um, takes away from, from some of the like the, the adventure element of it exactly but then it's sort of like you also don't want to be like reckless um and that first attempt for me was definitely borderline reckless um so i'm just trying to get my dogs out of here can you take these dogs <laughs> <laughs> so i got uh, <laughs> two italian greyhounds and they uh they go through waves of loving me uh, <laughs> one of those is right now but uh yeah it was like when i did the tour thing this year um that was like a very conscious decision before i was like like overnight um sleep deprivation stuff because i just like I want to be like fully switched on and alert. Yeah. You know? um, because so for, for anyone that's listening that isn't familiar with this, you want to share just a little bit about what that tour thing was? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I rode like the Tour de France route with all the transfers um, and like did it in the self supported style. Um, so it was, I think, five, five and a half thousand K, somewhere yeah. around in that realm. Um, <laughs> And like 17 days or so. Um, but yeah, awesome experience. And I guess I was, yeah, the idea was I was racing the tour, mm -hmm. um, which like, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, anyone who has like any experience in that kind of ultra realm, like you're just racing yourself really, aren't you? <laughs> it was never like. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah, and by doing it, it's not like I won the tour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, but you won doing, a lot of people's hearts, which was awesome. I to, was doing something very see. different. Um, but yeah, it was that was a cool, um, that was a really cool experience, um, and it was fun to like. I thought it was, it was cool because um, you know, like in the ultra world, it's not like it's not that far out there to do something like that, right? Like you can, you can get your head around that kind of effort mm -hmm. of like, all right, I'm pushing like 12 hours each day for three weeks. Um, it's like, it's big, but it's not crazy, Yeah, you know, but then you take that effort and you like take it into like the road cycling realm when everyone's mind's just like, blown, <laughs> you know? like how could anyone do that? Like well, a lot of people do. Um, uh, and I'd ask you, I think after you finished that, if, if that was your idea. And I think you had said yeah. that it was your boss's idea, but that the self-supported component was yours. Yeah. Yeah. Like their idea was to kind of do it like, um, like Ram style, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like have a, uh, have a van that I would sleep in and then like, you know, have like any food or water or anything given to me. Um, which to be honest, like um, I think that would be more difficult mentally for me um because like you've got so much to think about when you're doing something self-supported right like you're like okay i need to get water in within the next like 40k i need to like get some food for the next six hours like two hours down the road and then sort dinner and then work out where i'm gonna sleep and like in the meantime you're still just pedaling <laughs> you know like <laughs> and like you could be thinking about something you got to do and before you know it, like 20 Ks is gone. Yeah. Um, whereas the idea of like riding down a road and anytime you need something, you can just like put your hand up and grab it. Um, or anytime you need to stop and sleep, you could just stop. And that like, I think mentally that would be more difficult because the only thing you're doing is just pedaling. And then yeah, when you, you don't have to concern yourself with anything else. 
yeah um so like that was one element to why i wanted to do it that way and also like i think you just um like you end up engaging with where you are way more when you do it self-supported i think you know you meet more people you get a feeling for like you know the little towns when you're trying to find food or somewhere to sleep like mm-hmm. you just you end up just like actually having a an experience beyond the bike ride um so that's that was like my motivation for doing it that way um it wasn't about like making it harder <laughs> you know? well, it sounds like it was actually about making it easier in, yeah, in a totally. lot of ways that, like totally. and like you, you no, know, like with weight on your bike you forget about it after a day right like you get on there and you're like oh this thing is heavy <laughs> yep. but your body <laughs> adapts so fast cool. yeah yeah and then you forget and then you get back on a light bike and you're like this thing feels weird um, <laughs> you almost swerve yourself off the road yeah exactly exactly uh, yeah well, what what was the highlight of that that experience for you um to me I, I like a lot of people ask me that and like i just see the whole experience like for as in its entirety if that makes sense mm-hmm. um because like I feel like you get a lot more out of the bad moments, if I'm honest. Um, so, like, in hindsight, they, they're they kind of the highlights, like managing, hmm. if you're able to manage, like, the difficult moments, um, they're always that, or if you're able to manage it well, that's always a highlight for me. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't like to, like, pick one point. Um, hmm. mm-hmm. I had, like, one, I've one difficult night when, like, I ran out of, um, like, food and just like fully miscalculated you know and so i was out of food for like six hours and slept the night and then had to get up and ride mm-hmm. the next morning and um uh, that was something i've always been like worried about and then you know you, you're confronted with it and then you deal with it and then you're kind of like all right i'm not like i'm not gonna die out here yeah <laughs> like, yeah i had so that <laughs> i had that same thing happen when i was racing the arizona trail the yeah. first year the race the, the race happened on the full length of the trail so there were like very few people had biked the full length of the trail we had no idea in kind of planning for it how long certain sections would take like is it going to be 16 hours between resupply points or like 30 hours like just had no clue yeah. and so there was one one section that i wouldn't even say i miscalculated i think i was just a little optimistic thinking it might be a little faster than it actually was and yes. there's a tremendous amount of hiking on that. And I came up like these six hours shy of Flagstaff with my food oh. and same thing ended up sleeping the night. And then I still had four hours to pedal the next morning. And I was like, this is going to be a disaster. And I was just shocked at like, you know, I was hungry. My stomach hurt from how hungry it was, but I was still able to pedal in just fine. Like right. our bodies it's- are pretty amazing with what they're capable of. So true. It's so true. And Arizona Trail, that's where you have to, you hike in the end, right? You do the full Grand Canyon. Yeah, hike. when you're getting close to the, the northern end of the trail, you have to um, put your bike on your back like a park service rules and carry your bike across the canyon, which is like a 23-mile 20, hike, I think, something <laughs> like that. It's long. It's really long. Oh, that's huge. And it's like you get to the south rim and you look across at the other ones like, whoa that's really far away yeah. and the bot you can't even see the bottom like right. so it's, it's pretty intimidating to get there but i mean i've done that twice now and that's the only those the only two times i've hiked all the way across the canyon in one one push and it's such a cool experience it's really uncomfortable with a bike on your back but yeah it is you know just to do that all in one push and to do both times we're like doing it through the night and just being down that's in crazy it. And yeah it's really neat like that definitely is one of the highlights of of that whole race experience for me yeah but last time i did it was pushing with sleep deprivation on below parts than i wanted to and i was having these crazy hallucinations climbing out the north rim where you're like on the forested cliffs since there's these big trees and yeah. so i was hiking up that at probably what three or four in the morning and, and it was like this dead still night probably 40 degrees it was really nice actually clear skies as you can see the stars up above and I'd be walking along and then a branch, like a huge branch would fall out of one of the pine trees. And I'd literally like jump out of the way and you're on a pretty narrow trail with a big cliff. 
and you have a bike on your back. So I like jump on my extremely tired legs and like stumble. It's like, where'd the branch go? Oh shit. <laughs> and you know, nothing, no branch fell, but this kept happening as I was going up the trail. And my goal for that race that year was to like push the limit, but I didn't want to get to the point of that amount of yeah. information. And it just, just ended up there on that hike through the canyon. And so the whole hike up there was was really wild and then i got up to the rim put my bike back together just as the sun was coming up and started riding and then you're on pavement getting out of the park um and in the spring there's a snow detour just because the trail is usually under snow there still in may and so it ended up being like 30 miles of pavement and i could not stay away because literally just like swerving back and forth on the road falling asleep on the bike and so i laid down and set my alarm for 10 minutes i think and decided you know if this works great if not, I'm going to stop and sleep for a few hours, which is yeah. so hard to do because you're literally like 50 miles from the end at that point. Right. So close. And so I set my alarm for 10 minutes and it felt like as soon as I laid down, this raven started calling right above me. And so I woke up with a start and like looking around the tree and there's no raven anywhere. And then my alarm goes off. I was like, well, this is weird. <laughs> so I got back on my bike and I was actually okay. Like that was enough of a jolt awake. And so I still don't know right. if the Raven was actually there. If that was my brain, like, come on, you got to just like finish. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, if I made it to the end, but that was, that was a wild, wild ending to a, what mostly was a really fun ride. Yeah. Right. Right. I've only had like, I mean, I've been to like that sort of point once when I did this gravel race in Spain. Mm -hmm. And I was awake for like two days. Well, not quite two days, but like I had that same thing in the last like three or four hours of it. Mm -hmm. um, where like, I don't know if you have the same thing where it's like initially I would see like something and then it's like a very quick miscalculation of your brain. It makes it something like familiar, I think. Yeah. Or like, so like you see a rock and for me, it's like I always see the rocks and they become like a suitcase for some reason. <laughs> Yep. So like, Some, yeah, something weird. I, I had one, the lichens on rocks in the bottom of Grand Canyon when I was hiking through would be uh, like Chinese characters. And <laughs> so I was just seeing these all over in the rocks and I have no right. idea where that comes from. But That's so weird. And But I have the same one. And then like the trees always look like um, like uh, military personnel like lined up like, mm -hmm. like they're marching or something. Yeah. Um, but I'm like very aware it's not real. If that makes mm -hmm. sense oh yeah but then i kind of got like way further down the track and then like had really strange like like time would pass impossibly slow um like i felt like a minute felt like half an hour and i was like <laughs> oh my god i'm losing it and then i felt like <laughs> the sky was like a ceiling right above my head and i was like okay i need to like same thing i was like i've got like two hours to get this down otherwise i gotta stop you know? yeah um, yeah in, in all the races i've done over the years i've kind of started to put a a limit on myself like i don't want to get to that point anymore because sleep deprivation is like it's it's hard on our brains in yeah the long term and so it's like if it's just a few hours of it or like one night of it it's okay but there's you know some people really seem to glorify like dealing with that night after night and tour divide or something like that and yeah and it's not not where i want to put myself at this point yeah totally i was i was like interested to go there once to see how it was and it's not something that i'd like to do again <laughs> yeah what's your favorite route like for, for racing or for touring um either touring hmm. well i mean i just i don't actually ride that many routes more than once um right just because i'm usually just i want to go see something else do something and else. like I think race in race mode there, I do end up going back to the same ones because it's really fun for me to be able to kind of run experiments, like doing one thing differently and seeing how that plays out. Um, yeah. But I mean, well, I just went with a few friends, rode the Colorado 14ers route, which yeah. is like a 200 mile loop, 250 mile loop in the central part of the state that has like five bike legal 14ers along the way. And I've ridden that twice now and both times it was so much fun and so exhausting but like you can push your bike up five 14ers and then a ride back down if right. you like really challenging trail and there's 
almost nothing that compares to like rolling off a 14er on single track and just being like, I'm on top of the world. And now I just need to hang on for like 4,000 feet. And That's so cool. Each, each descent is so different from every other one. Um, right. They, they just have, they all have their own completely different character. So that, I love that route a lot. And another one I really like is out in, in the Bears Ears region of Utah and basically like connecting Moab to Monticello to um, the Colorado river at height. That, that yeah. section of it is just really special and it's all like cheap road, dirt road. There's no trail on, on any of that, but it's just one of these landscapes that you're out there. It's like, I can't believe this actually exists. And yeah. it just goes on and on and on like that. Yeah. And so I've done that a few times now. I'd like to get back out there again this fall to ride that one again. One of those places you look around, you're like, where is everyone? Yeah, it's <laughs> you know? it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And then, yeah. It's, I mean, the Arizona Trail 300 is far and away my favorite race route. And yeah. it's like the southern 300 miles of the Arizona Trail. It's almost all single track. It's amazing desert riding. Some of the sections of it are like you just get out in there and you're like, whoever laid this trail out had absolutely amazing vision for like yeah. where it goes, where, where it was built, how it was built. Like there's some really world-class stuff on, huh. on that route out near um, Superior, Arizona. And I think I've raced that like seven or eight times now. And nice. I just never get tired of it. It's, yeah. it's so, the riding is so fun. It's, and that's been one that it was, you know, early on, there were all these sleep deprivation experiments that we ran that we were like, Oh, it's, you know, if you sleep four hours a night, that's going to be fastest. Like the best combination of, being able to ride fast during the day and catching up on sleep at night. And then that just came down farther and farther and farther. Yeah. And our times kept getting faster. And then one year I rode it without sleeping at all. And it, it ended up oh, being yeah. like 40, 48 hours or something, I think at that point. And I was like, huh, never thought that was possible, but what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that one, I think it's, just, it's special because there was so much learning that happened on that for, yeah, for a lot right. of us that started racing that one back in the like late 2000s, I guess. A while ago. Is that, I've looked at that 14 as route and that thing looks hard. <laughs> like it's so like it looks just from I mean, and I can imagine the reality of it is even more difficult than like how it looks. But like but I just feel like the people would look like look at that and be like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. And then you get out there and you're like, <laughs> oh my God, this is horrific. But the, the really cool <laughs> thing about that one is like you can ride the core loop and just ride past every one of the 14ers and you don't have to do any of them. Or yeah. when I did it um, uh, a few months ago, um, Hillary Allen was one of the folks that came with us and she was in Boulder. Yeah. She's a pro professional sky runner. And so she ran all the peaks and oh, nice. had a blast doing that and stash her bike at the bottom. Yeah. And so you can do that. You can hike it. You can ride your bike up like that Elbert or something like that. One of the easiest ones, which is still yeah. hard, but um, more manageable, more rideable, both up and down, or you can tackle more than one if you want but like there's so many ways that you can do that one and if you just ride yeah, the core cool. the core loop of it it's a it's like some of the more rideable colorado trail sections in the arkansas valley then and then some backcountry stuff on the east side up by buffalo peaks that almost never gets ridden but it's really cool trail most hmm. of it i should caveat most of it's really cool trail over there a little bit <laughs> little bit's a little overgrown and covered in deadfall after a fire but <laughs> right gotcha gotcha i make the fun <laughs> Yeah. do you so you're you coach a bunch of athletes or do you do. have many yeah i've been coaching for i think seven years now and okay. i've never actually had a coach myself which is kind of interesting in all yeah. the different types of racing i've done over the years but um started having people ask me like eight, eight years ago or so if i'd help them get ready for ultras and mm -hmm. at first i was like no i don't feel like competent to coach people um, right. but then as I was running a lot of those kind of experiments on like the Arizona trail 300 or the, the Coconino loop, which is like a 250 mile loop just North of where I live. That was a really good, very local one to go do. And it was like, you know, 36 hours or something. So kind of that boundary between, you know, not too hard on the body, but you can still do yeah. some pretty serious experimenting with the, on the ultra mindset on that. So I started doing stuff there and then realized that there really wasn't that much knowledge out there, like scientific knowledge about what this the efforts, thing is. Like, yeah. yeah. And so I, I, at that point I dug into like as much of the scientific literature as I could find on these efforts. And a lot of it was based on these like different events in Europe, a lot of like ultra triathlons 
that mm -hmm. you know would have um the participants coming back to like a transition zone and so scientists could be there like taking blood samples or you're, like actually monitoring things yeah or in ram was another one that there's been some yeah. studies done that's easy to be like be with the riders so i just got really fascinated by all that and like i'm a, a scientist by training um yeah. theology which is very different but so got really fascinated by all that and then started digging into the coaching side of things it was like okay i actually feel like i could help like i know what to do for myself so if i just kind of apply that and all this other stuff i'm learning to some other folks see what happens and it worked really well i coached a lot of people mm -hmm. that had a lot of success and um really put a lot of emphasis on trying to it seems like really encourage people to ride the way you do like just do things that sound fun and incorporate the training into that right and, yeah um, yeah that's like that's so important because if you show up to an ultra and you're kind of mentally burned out from the training from like being so okay. focused on that you're screwed for the race itself yeah. like you'd, you'd be you'd be so much better off showing up to that race much less trained much less fit and so much more enthusiastic like you'll have a better race you'll stand a better chance of finishing you'll probably go faster to be honest um, yeah so it's it's been really fun to, to coach folks um for those sorts of things and i've coached some folks for shorter like 100 mile type things yeah. and shorter than that um but coaching ultra athletes is really what what i love doing and whether it's folks training for their first one or for trying to go super fast and like to divide or something and do you set like your own programs then do you do you follow like a do you have like a mud map of like okay i'm kind of trying to do this or you just kind of feel it out for, for myself yeah for my yeah i don't have I've, i haven't followed a training plan in years like even one that i put together for myself like yeah a general progression of what i know works well for myself and mm -hmm. for me it's a lot of like wake up on any certain day and like hmm, where do i feel like riding today yeah. Ooh, that sounds like today's ride i was like i want to go ride out on the other side of the bradshaws and then think okay well i should be doing this i should be <laughs> in quotes doing yeah. this for, for training in this phase right now and there's a 3000 foot climb toward the end of that that i can actually work stuff Just into and totally and like i do a, i spend a lot of time doing intervals on trails like mm -hmm. techie trail climbs which isn't the best way to do intervals but it's so much fun and yeah, exactly. i'd rather i'd rather do them poorly and have fun doing it than you know spend all my time on some like gravel road climb going back there day after day to to do totally. workouts on it and go so up and down it Oof. yeah 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 that's interesting that's kind of a very similar way to how i approach riding training do you have a coach uh no <laughs> is, your, is your team okay with that uh yeah i i uh so i had no coach for like two years and then at the end of last year um i started working with a coach from the team mm -hmm. so the first like four or five months of this year i guess i was coached um like and we had a very good it was more like two days a week he was like okay try and get this in <laughs> like i understand that like and that was like as, <laughs> as far as we could really get um and then um i i just to be honest like um i just don't do well with like structured training mm -hmm. um and i can get more more out of myself if it's not written down <laughs> you know um and same thing i kind of get motivated just by different routes i could do um mm -hmm and like different places to ride and then i've just gotten better at being like honest with myself in that like i'm like okay i could probably get this much out of myself today or i do actually feel good like mm -hmm. it's okay to push or i'd really love to do this ride but like i'm struggling to get out of bed um so i've gotten better at that um which i think has ultimately just helped me like perform better probably um like and there's a lot and there's a lot of people who do well with like really structured stuff um i think a lot of people really do thrive in that like not having to totally. think about what to do like somebody just tells them go do this and if you know if that's a coach that knows the person well and can give them really reasonably challenging workouts and yeah like recognize when recovery is needed and when easier rides are needed that works really well for totally. so many folks but i don't yeah i think i'm i mean I've been coaching myself for so many years now and I still don't 
have a great idea what I'm going to be capable of on certain days. And yeah, exactly. So if, if I suddenly feel really good and I can go out and do, you know, long intervals at the end of a six hour ride, it's like, sweet. I never would have told myself to do that if I was coaching myself, but it worked yeah. out and that's great. Um, yeah. 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 That's so true. And like the end vice versa. I feel, yeah. Like sometimes you need someone to tell you to slow down, but I always feel like, you you're actually capable of a lot more and a lot of coaches are quite um not afraid everyone's just errs on the side of caution a bit mm-hmm. right yeah because yep. it's like it's definitely easy to do too much um and but sometimes like you kind of like need to just go out and see what you can do mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> you know and you, you often like you surprise yourself like you said like riding two days on the uh arizona trail like if someone prescribed that to you, you'd be like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, totally. But, but you're like, when it's your own decision, you're kind of like, well, I'm just experimenting on myself here. And then, you know, there's quite a bit, quite a bit of like uh, progression that can happen there. I think. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, just, I just find it interesting because like a lot of people, because um, I've never done any specific like ultra training. I just do a lot of hours because I like to run a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, like, even like you said, like, before the tour thing I did this year, I didn't ride for 10 days because exactly that. I'd, like, come out of a huge racing block and spent, like, a month on the road and was kind of mentally just, like, I don't feel like riding. Mm -hmm. I'm about to go and ride around France for three weeks. (laughs) So I was like, what's the best training I can do? And I was like, the best training you can do is just to do nothing until you get there. So you're super excited to go right. I'd be interested to hear your opinion on this, but like, I feel like the, you come into like the ultra world and you're like, I'm going to carry all this stuff. And for me, like I'm coming from road racing. So I'm like, I need to carry as little stuff as I can. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're like, I need to like, <laughs> have, like, like a light sleeping bag. Like I just need like, you know, I can get stuff if I need it. And then you start and your bike's heavy anyway, right? It doesn't matter like three or four kilos either way. For me, I think mm-hmm. like it's just more or less the same. Um, but if you don't have something, that's all you think about. And you're just like, oh God, I hope I don't like, I hope I don't slice this sidewall because like I mm-hmm. decided I wasn't going to bring that extra tire or like, yeah, I hope it doesn't get too cold because, like, I only brought, like, the medium weight jacket. And I feel like, for me anyway, I, you waste so much time just, like, being a bit stressed about it. Mm-hmm. Or, like, that I realized, like, for when, when I did the tour, I just brought everything. <laughs> you know, I just had and so then, much Yeah, time. and then you have this confidence knowing that, like, whatever nature throws at you or whatever situation you have to deal with with your bike, you know, within reason you're fine with and then you can yeah yeah, leave all that all those concerns behind and just know that you're you're set yeah 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 that's That's, like that's my conclusion now is that like if you feel if you're second guessing something just take it or like if you're thinking like uh should i run like a heavier tire just just run it you know what i mean Uh, i totally agree with that it took me quite a few years to come to that same conclusion like the first couple of times I raced um, Tour Divide and Arizona Trail and things like that, I was, you know, trying to get my weight down as much as possible with what I was carrying. And so skimping on sleep systems, skimping on clothing, that sort of thing. And then you end up just like cold, which stresses you out and stresses your body out. And in Tour Divide, especially when you're out there for two plus weeks, that's a lot of right. sleeping outside. And if you're just like waking up shivering, that's your body's not re- like your body's doing the opposite of recovering. Like you're you might as adding. well just be riding. <laughs> yeah. And so I think like from one year to the next in that race, um, the amount I carried just steadily increased and yeah. like heavier sleep kit, but warmer. And so I was more comfortable at night and like, I was less worried about needing to find like a warm place to sleep or yeah. anything like that. And it was, that was, yeah, just such a kind of a relief actually. And I felt way better. Um, after yeah. every night of being out there with a more comfortable setup and then the third the third year i did it i ended up doing it on a tandem which was the physical physically hardest thing i've ever done and on the tandem yeah it's all right it was i mean there's almost no technical riding on that route so that element of it was easy but i was like oh we'll like we'll go slow up the climbs because it's going to be hard and we'll fly on the descents and we'll make up ground on everyone else in the flats 
And it was more like, just get up the climbs, survive the descents, and then recover on the flats. Yeah, <laughs> it was like everything about it was hard, um, <laughs> so physically weird. hard. And uh, how, how much did that? How much did that rig weigh? Like by the time you had everything on there, I don't even know. There, I mean, there's, there's, so there's you need like two scales or something to weigh it. <laughs> oh um, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, it, the bike itself was probably forty-five pounds. Yeah, and then gear for two people on it. I mean, it was probably 90, 90 pounds right, with like yeah. a bit of food. And what sort of brakes you need? Some, you need some yeah, we had like we had a dual crown fork, like a hundred millimeter dual crown fork on it from White Brothers, and um, one of those roll off internally geared rear hubs, which was awesome because it meant that I could just like shift without having to tell my partner that you know back off the pedal kind of thing. And then I think we were just running XT mono XT brakes, but with yeah. like downhill rotors big rotors, on there. Yeah. and yeah it took us like two days to run through the first set of pads and <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah it was it was an adventure and just the, I, it was really interesting to try to like legitimately race an ultra but with another person and seeing how like your rhythm through the day energy wise yeah. and enthusiasm wise and everything is probably never going to match the other person's and so it's just yeah. like you know, you'd have like an hour where you both feel really good. And then three hours where one person feels great. And the other person is just like in an energy low or like hasn't been eating enough or something. And so then the person that's working, that's feeling good, works a little harder to try to, you know, keep pace up. And then they just wear themselves out. And then the other person feels better. And it's just like, it, totally. it, yeah. That would be, yeah. I, I, could, I don't think I could manage that. Um, I feel like for me, I, I always feel like I'm on such a, personal mission but like mm -hmm. i'm even very like i feel like i'm pretty sensitive to like any interaction really you know like <laughs> i feel like when you you can just read like something the wrong way and think mm -hmm. about it for three hours or whatever so like <laughs> I, I try and keep my contact down to like i maybe speak with my wife once a day uh-huh but even then i'm trying to make sure like i'm in a really good mood and i try and like make sure like i'm gonna call when i know she'll be in a good mood because otherwise yeah. like, yep if i if i get like something that i just feel is negative or whatever like I, that can totally yeah and it can me. just it just gnaws at you like it, it's hard to push things like that out of your head when all you're doing is pedaling and totally kind of, yeah yeah but yeah. those things can really like yeah unravel you, if, well, like. if you if you ever do something like that on a tandem you'll probably be too tired to even care about any of that like yeah. <laughs> don't have the mental energy to deal with it <laughs> i don't care if i burn this friendship <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get this down uh, are you gonna do any more um of the like fat bike stuff like i did a rod in that i well i have no set plans for that right. like those were really just a strange set of circumstances like i live in arizona which we don't really have winter here or at least <laughs> there it snows and then it's gone in like a week and yeah. so i'd always i'd watched and marveled at the iditarod trail racers for like 15 years and <laughs> there's a really talented um journalist from up there that would write like article updates about the races as they go on as, as they went on and so i'd read those every year and marvel at what the riders and skiers and runners were pushing through and never envisioned myself doing it. And then a few years ago, my teammate Kate Boyle was in a really bad car crash on Christmas Eve and up in Idaho. And so I drove up there um, to help her out after that. And I got there and she was still in the ICU and like drugged up. And like the second thing she said after I got there was like, are you going to do JP's race? And I was like, wait what and jp jay peter very runs a um like a it used to be a 200k and a 200 mile fat bike race now it's how it came up and did that oh, okay two, yeah, two yeah, years yeah. ago yeah and like i drove up there quite last minute like i didn't bring a bike i don't think or maybe i had a mountain bike didn't have any winter gear or anything and i was like no like i'm not gonna do a winter ultra <laughs> like i haven't even been riding my bike that much lately yeah. and then pretty quickly every Buddy in the valley that knew her knew me was like oh you can borrow my bike i've got boots jp was like oh just come over to my garage like we'll get you set up with everything you need and it was like 
to the point that I couldn't say no. Yeah, and, <laughs> I have to do this thing. Now. <laughs> yeah, and so I did it, and it was like I was so out of my element. The weather was decent for it, um, but like 200 miles in snow is hard. Um, yeah, the way around that, and I ended up. It came down to a sprint with Neil Belchenko, and I beat him in the sprint in the parking lot at the <laughs> wow. lodge. And so I was like, "Huh, that's weird," but I'll take it. Like winning a race yeah. is always fun, and then the really odd element of it was that the winner of that race gets an automatic qualification for the ITI in Alaska. And right. I was so like, okay, electric. well, now I'm qualified. I'm in no way like skill wise qualified to go up and race in Alaska, but I had it in to like do the race. And yeah. so that was kind of too something I couldn't pass up. And so I went back to Idaho the next winter and spent a while training and doing some winter camping and had Kate teach me some more stuff about winter camping because she's done so much of it. And um, then felt comfortable enough to go do the race in Alaska sure. and it was awesome the race was such a cool experience um and I kept actually touring on the route after the race with um with a friend and we had planned to ride the whole thing except then the pandemic kind of set in up there too sure. and the native villages closed to visitors so we ended up flying out and made it halfway mm-hmm. but um so that was I don't know I think I'd, be, I'd I think I'd be more likely to go ride the full I did rod trail in tour mode than yeah do any more go race. winter winter racing but for me it's just like that's the ultimate expert level bikepacking I feel like you I, know it's just I, like I mean I've been I, asked about that and I'm just like there's no way like <laughs> people don't understand how much more difficult it is you're just like there's <laughs> there's so much management right and I think that's the only reason I was able to be successful in those races was that like the self-care side of things I had down. So like gotcha. taking care of myself and like feeding myself and all of that, like I didn't have to put any energy into it. It was all second nature, but the yep. like managing temperature, sweat, all of that stuff, the yes. bike and like that, I could focus all my energy on that instead and manage to do well in, in both those races and have a, a good time in them but it's yeah definitely i was very out of my element and in alaska very intimidated at times like yeah. it, got, it got down to like minus 45 degrees fahrenheit in in that <laughs> one which i had never i'd never been in temperatures below minus 25 and i don't think i'd ever ridden in temperatures below like minus 10 so oh my gosh. Uh, yeah <laughs> that was to the point of like okay i need to think about everything i do really carefully because the consequences here are about as high as they get for, totally screwing up yeah yeah because you're just you're out there like there's no one that's going to come get you right it's like like you could sweat too much and then you can just die yeah and like (laughs) that whole that whole progression could happen in like 30 minutes or something like that and if you fall behind on calories that just accelerates that whole process even further yeah yeah it's just consequences are really high so and then even like getting to where your food is, right? Like trying to get your gloves off, and like, I can't imagine. That's being yeah, hard. it's there's there's so <laughs> many little things that just end up being hugely really challenging, big. and you have, to, you have to think about that carefully. Like, okay, I need to eat a snack. It's minus forty five. How do I eat my snack without getting frostbite? <laughs> sure. Yeah, legitimate concern. But it's um, awesome. I'm glad I did it once, and I think tour mode up there was really cool because like the, the sled dog race was going through and so we could actually yeah. like stop and talk with the mushers and hear that's cool. like hear what they were going through like that's its own like next level ultra endurance type thing, thing. imagine like trying to race a, a sled dog team through the night for like 10 days or however long it takes them and you have to take care of your entire dog team and yourself yeah but the dogs come first and so it's like it was wild seeing just what what those folks go through and what they put themselves through and how that compares to like ultra bike events and an ultra bike event seem pretty tame in a lot of ways. Totally, totally. <laughs> there's always something more right <laughs> yep there is but just yeah, i guarantee you did something big you're like oh man i didn't even scratch the surface yep. so much out there. but i guarantee you'll never see me racing a sled dog team <laughs> <laughs> not uh, oh, not for me yeah. cool well this Sweet, has been man. fun at some point we need to meet up for an actual like on the ground adventure uh, absolutely that'd be a yeah, lot of fun we should make it happen this uh this winter i don't think uh i don't think i'm going back to australia anytime soon so <laughs> yeah it to. sounds like it might be hard to get back in or hard to get out if you do get in yeah so. yeah it's just not really on the card so i think uh 
I think I'm going to be around all winter. So a cool. desert a desert adventure sounds good. That'd be fun. Yeah, let's let's stay in touch about that. It's I've got Sweet. nothing specific in the plans after the next six weeks or eight weeks. So. Sweet. Sweet, man, either. Sounds good, mate. Cool. Well, <laughs> thanks for chatting. It's great to catch That's up. It. Thanks for the chat. And uh, take... catch you soon. Yeah, take care, man.